Today, it has been replaced by a new one. But the view is still substantially the same. This is what Horrocks would have seen. In front of him was a huge river, the Val. To his east, the ancient city of Nijmegen, with its two bridges. The nearer one carries the railway, the further one, at that stage amongst the largest in Europe, the road. The town was already wreathed in smoke from the street fighting which was taking place. But he could see more smoke, away to the north. He could see smoke from the fighting at Arnhem. Frost and his men had held the bridge for three days now without reinforcement. But the tanks of the SS Panzer divisions were beginning to blast them out. The tactic was to uh, fire high explosive into the sides of the building to break the wall down, then fire smoke shells through that. And of course the smoke shells have got phosphorus in them. The phosphorus sets, lights to any, uh, sets light to anything inflammable in the house and they then burned the perimeter down bit by bit over the period of the next 48 hours. Once the water ran out uh, and the flames became um, uncontrollable, then you had to get out of the building as quickly as you could and get into another one and set that up for defence. Just a few miles away in Nijmegen, Horrocks' soldiers had had no success in crossing the bridge. They were still fighting in the streets of the town. It was time to try another approach. Horrocks held a conference here at the power station. The plan was to cross the river in force in boats. To do so in daylight was a fearsome undertaking. The Germans were securely ensconced behind a dike on the far bank of the river, making the attack doubly dangerous. But if the Allies were to reach Arnhem in time, risks had to be taken. Having been ordered up from Grave the previous night, Moffat Burris was at the conference. And when we got to the top floor, already there was Colonel Tucker, our regimental commander, and General Browning, and General Horrocks. And uh, General Horrocks asked Colonel Tucker, is this an awesome task? Can your lads do it, Colonel Tucker? And Colonel Tucker's response was, well, General, if we take the bridge, will your troops be lined up ready, will your tanks be lined up ready to go? And I can remember his words as if he said them yesterday. He said, my, my tanks will be lined up in full force, hell-bent for Arnhem, and nothing will stop them. Horrex's confidence seemed boundless. Those tanks would come from the Grenadier Guards, who were now in the middle of a bitter battle in Nijmegen, fighting through houses and streets, and finally through a wooded park which overlooked the bridge. It was very slow and difficult fighting. At two o'clock that afternoon, the guns of 30 Corps opened fire on the German positions across the river. We were really horrified that uh, we would be crossing that swift river in those uh, canvas paddle boats. Because with only three, four, five, or six paddles in there, the men had to paddle with their rifle butts. While the crossing was in progress, Horrocks and Browning were watching from the top of the power station. Almost like monarchs, looking out over some 18th century battlefield. Unable to influence things, and well aware that triumph or disaster hinged on the sheer courage of the men down here. Well, when we got about a th the lead boat got about a third away across, all hell broke loose. That's when the rifle fire, the machine gun fire, 20 millimeter fire, just open fire. started slumping in the boat, some of them killed, some of them wounded. 
I remember in my boat, um, I was sitting on the back seat with the engineer and he was standing there with the boat paddle uh, acting as a rudder. And he had one hand was on the side of the boat and I noticed his wrist turn red and he said, Captain, take the rudder, I've been hit. Well, just as I reached for the rudder, he caught a 20 millimeter high explosive right through his head and it just blew his head apart, just blew it off. And I was just covered with my head and shoulders and side with his blood and brains and I caught some of the uh, shrapnel in my side. When we hit the opposite bank, all right, let's go head straight for the dike. Well, as we started across that pasture, those machine guns just had a complete field of fire that, that it was just running through a hail of bullets. Nobody stopped unless they were hit. The Val crossing was one of the bravest attacks of the entire campaign. Crossing the river and taking this dike cost Barris about half his company. But the survivors then had to go on and take those bridges to help the tanks to get across. When they reached the road leading to the bridge, the Americans achieved complete surprise. But then they heard the sound of tanks. They thought the tanks were German. But they weren't. They were the tanks of the Grenadiers, led by a sergeant from Lord Carrington's squadron. He, uh, he and his tanks, three tanks, whatever they were, went over and I followed him over. I thought they were going to blow the bridge up at any moment, and I imagine so did he. Um, and I was absolutely astonished when we got over the bridge. We just swarmed over the tank and started hugging the guys. I remember the guy's head that was sticking out of the turret. I just hugged him around the neck and I said, you guys are the greatest sight I've seen in, a, in years. And I kissed the tank and told them to head on to Arnhem. But the tanks didn't move. Ahead of them on the road was a German anti-tank gun. So I went over and I said, why are you stopping? Why, why, are, you, why are you not going to Arnhem? He said, well, I can't go up there. That gun will knock out my tank. And I said, well, we'll go with you and get that gun. And uh, he said, no, I can't go without orders. The guards had fought their way onto the bridge through tough resistance, and they were worried about the ground on the other side of the bridge. The road from the bridge was on a sort of embankment. And I think it would have been quite difficult to go ahead. I think it would have been difficult anywhere, even in the daylight, because you were a sitting duck for anybody who was there. But I thought at night, when we'd just sort of stormed the bridge, so to speak, it would have been very difficult to push through in the, in the dark. Well, I felt betrayed. I just sacrificed half of my company to uh, capture that bridge. And... Um, in the face of dozens of guns and uh, they were stopping because of one gun and they had a whole core of tanks. The tanks didn't move that night. The Grenadiers' war diary speaks of the need to consolidate the captured bridge. But it's clear that Horrocks's sense of high tempo hadn't percolated down the chain of command. Although the Grenadiers weren't to know it, there was almost nothing between them and Arnhem, eight miles away. And the plan might yet have worked, because in Arnhem, Frost's men still retained their handhold on the north end of the bridge. 